the moment after the darkest of times, the next decision that we make is our legacy decision. And that's how we're remembered. Ben Carrot. Ben Carrot. Entrepreneur, mega house flipper, Olympic wrestling athlete, and he's an international public speaker. I had to respond like a victor or a victim because I was born with something called Cruzon syndrome. And the doctors would say, yo, you're gonna live a different life. And I would have multiple surgeries again and again and again, trach in my throat cut my head open from ear to ear. And then they would also detail what my life assumedly would be. Yeah, they gave you the forecast on your life. They gave me the forecast of what is normal. We don't do normal though, that's a different. <laughs> that's the difference. We say, oh yeah, okay, that's cute. Let's be disobedient to average. We don't do average. The people who are different, it's because what they do after they're different. Mm. That's the difference. I think that's where the victim mentality comes into play that plagues the world. Yeah. Is they think, oh, I'm different. This happened, that happened. Give me a bone, cut me some slack. Mm, no. Yeah. It's what you choose to do after that. It's how you could have been a victim and answered that way and it would have felt warranted. But it's after that of the choices you decide that create the victory. Yeah. This is an interview with Ben Kerr. Ben is just a larger than life man, but was born with Cruzon syndrome. And so when you meet him for the first time, it's easy to look at him and say, man, this is just a shorter guy with some, with a deformed face. And, and at first glance, that's what you get. But as you sit down with Ben and as you really start to listen to him talk, man, this is just an inspirational dude. He's somebody who's got, just incredible belief in himself. He's got incredible belief in others. He has a way of being able to instill confidence and belief in everybody and had such an incredible belief and, and work ethic that he became Utah Valley University's only All-American wrestler and part of the USA national team. So this is just an episode of hope and inspiration. I genuinely love this one. No excuses. You'll see this from Ben. Thank you for joining another episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Strap in and thank you for being here. Ben Kerr, welcome to the Roller Coaster Podcast. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for making the time. You, you were actually, ironically, one of the hardest guests that I've ever had to book because you're just like doing so much. And so I look forward to unpacking that. For the audience who's listening and not watching, I want to describe the man that I see in front of me. And by the way, Ben and I don't know each other super well, okay? So let me describe him. He's probably five foot something, three, four. Five, three, you got it. Okay, he's five foot three. So he's, he's a smaller man in stature. But his facial features look different to me. And I think they look different for a reason. I don't think they just look different because genetically that's what happened from your mom and your dad, right? Do people ever comment on the way that you look, Ben? 100%. Okay. And, yeah. And what's your response when people ask you, like, dude, what happened to you? Yeah, 100%. Um, I would invite people to go on my YouTube channel and they could see. I could say some pretty stuff right now, but I wanted to see yeah. Uh, what they will see there is the opportunity I had to respond like a victor or a victim because I was born with something called Cruzon syndrome and the doctors would say, yo, you're going to live a different life. And I would have multiple surgeries again and again and again, trach in my throat, cut my head open from ear to ear. Um, I mean, multiple surgeries. And then they would also detail what my life assumedly would be. Yeah. They gave you the forecast on your life. They gave me the forecast of what is normal. We don't do normal though. That's a different, <laughs> that's the difference. We say, oh yeah, okay, that's cute. Let's be disobedient to average. We don't do average. How many people have Cruzon syndrome? Not very many. I'm a rarity. 
but I'm a rare among the rarity. That's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think that it's probably safe to say that even if you don't have Cruzon syndrome, I mean, how many millions of people suffer from something that is not normal, right? Mm. Where when they see you beat the odds, the forecast, they feel inspired, right? There's a reason why um, you, to me, are one of the most inspirational men in the world. It's because you've really just beat the odds. You were one in a million, right? Yeah, and I think the difference was I had a podcast earlier today here, and we talked about the different the people who are different. People aren't on podcasts. They're not on stages because they're different. It's because what they do after they're different. Mm. That's the difference. I think that's where the victim mentality comes into play, the yeah. entitlement mentality that plagues the world, Yeah, is they think, oh, I'm different. This happened. That happened. Give me a bone. Cut me some slack. Mm, no. Yeah. It's what you choose to do after that. It's how you could have been a victim and answered that way, and it would have felt warranted, but it's after that of the choices you decide that create the victory. Yeah. I say this. I say the moment after the darkest of times, the next decision that we make is our legacy decision, and that's how we're remembered. If you, if, if you think about your own life, if you think about the, the legendary stories that are told in movies, it's what's the decision that you make in the movie, Rudy, one of my favorite. He quit the team. And the janitor cleaner, the, 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 the black gentleman comes out and he's like, hey, what are you doing? And it's the decision right then and there that told him to go freaking put your pads back on. That made the complete decision that created that movie. It's Jesus Christ literally being on the cross and saying, forgive them for they do not know what they do. It's Jesus coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane and his right hand, dude, cutting off the ear. Jesus probably should have told him to cut off the other ear. These guys are here to kill me. His buddy just traded slave money to sell him, Hmm. the king of the world. But what did Jesus do? That literally made the decision of what his legacy would be. He held the ear. I mean, every single legendary move became out of a potential failure or dark time. And then it's the next decision that people make that makes them legendary, that makes them victorious. Go on, go on the YouTube, go on whatever, and the comments I make are comments of love because I've learned self-love. It wasn't always that way, nor does it come naturally. But I believe that we're not born to be natural. We're not born to be normal. We're born to be abnormal. We're born to be extraordinary. And as we do that, and have it be genuine, that's the fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, what you're describing is, uh, you know, Lou Holtz famously talked about his 1090 rule, right? Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% with how you react, how you deal with it, right? I want to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart that I think a lot about right now. Because in the last few years in my life, I've been through, in the last two years, I had been through more than I had been through in the previous 30 plus years of my life Um, with the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. It's Mm. been a, it's been a roller coaster for sure, to say the least. So I've had to really think about this concept of identity, right? I'm assuming you don't let how you look define who you are at all. But maybe there's something in your identity or your I am statement Mm. or your personal creed that is that, that's recognizing that, hey, yes, I, I was born with this thing. It is different, but but how I show up every day is really what matters, right? So how would you describe your identity? Like, who are you really at your core? Um, I'm a man of light that shows up and can pour into others with empathy because whether or not they have Cruzon syndrome or not, I have an understanding 
I love big, and I understand even bigger. And I think people know me because of that. Um, I had a I had a friend's wife come up to me one time, and she never met me, but she just heard about me. She said, "Hey, you're a lot smaller than what I thought because you live big." Mm. And I don't know how else do you live. How else do you live when God created us to live big? Yeah. God created us to shine, and I didn't always live that way. I put myself behind a bushel, and that is the best way to be suffocated. That is the best way to not understand, like, power and connection in other humans. And so Ben Care is a person that puts himself out there and sometimes, you know, gives caution to the wind and says, let's go. Because... um, I mean, life's short, man, and uh, there's a lot of people out there striving to figure out who they are, mm. and they need a little bit of help from other people, I think, and we can be that person. Yeah. I heard something the other day that really inspired me, which was, it doesn't take anything away from your candle to light somebody else's candle. Mm. Your light will be the same, right? And I also, one of the ways I love thinking about this is, currently in my life, my cup is overflowing, right? And we go through seasons where it's overflowing and sometimes it's barely, you got barely anything in that cup. But in the seasons where it's overflowing or when the candle is shining the brightest, I think it's Mm. so important to pour that excess into somebody else's cup. Why would you let it hit the ground if you could actually just go, here you go. Totally. Take that. How does that feel, right? I had a mentor tell me this. This is the best explanation of how to receive a compliment. In life, when you're under these lights, when you're behind the camera, it's so easy. And this can also be the decline of man Mm. because you get the pat on the back sometimes. The light burns a little bright. And then all of a sudden, the compliments come at times, right? And my... Mentor said this, then compliments are like a hot potato. Take it. Everybody needs the warmth. But gift it away. Pass it along, yeah. Before you get burned. And so it's brilliant because we all need the warmth. Mm. We all need to receive the warmth. Because I also hear people, I have some family members that can't take a compliment. That's also rude. Right? You look so pretty in that dress. Yeah, but I'm fat and bat, 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 bat. the potato and then you, away. <laughs> yeah, you bat it away, you slap the person in the face. Yeah. Literally, yeah. it's a compliment. Receive it with grace because yeah. we deserve that. But my mentors, he said, take the potato, feel the warmth, and then immediately gift it. So what would that look like is this. Oh, Ben, you did great on stage. You spoke so well. Thank you so much. I can't even tell you how lucky I am to be here. I've been gifted so many blessings by so many mentors I've had. And then you pour back into the business or the company or the person that invited you. And that's what keeps you down, humbled, and people want to be surrounded by you. One gift I had, we talked about your gift, right? The gift of communication that that we talked about just barely. A God, I call them God gifts. A God gift that I have is being, I call it just a fanboy. I love fanboying on other people. Cheering people on. Oh, dude. Like, I get geeked (laughs) out by, like, bragging on people. And it makes people feel uncomfortable sometimes because I'm just like, I freaking love you. And sometimes they're like, are you genuine? We don't do it enough in life. How can we pour more into people and just let them know. And sometimes they almost feel like it's not genuine because they don't feel it themselves about them. Yeah. And when you don't know and haven't recovered or discovered who you are and how powerful you freaking are, mm. well, that's where that's where the da- that's where the danger lies. So I have Cruzon syndrome. First thing that you see, do Facebook, Facebook, right? <laughs> it's like my face, right? Oh, man. (laughs) It's been one of the biggest gifts in my entire life because you see it. 
right now. Yeah. Like literally it's been a big, it's one, it's been such a gift. The danger is the diseases or the syndromes, but nobody sees. That's the tough stuff. Mm. That's the hard things. And uh, Nick sent in a star, so he's a speaker. He um, is missing some limbs. He says, people think I'm, what does he say, disabled? He's like, inside, that's where the disablement happens. When people can't realize where those shortcomings lie, and they don't deal with them because it's not apparent. It's not, it's not in your face, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been a gift in my life. It's allowed me a platform. That's beautiful. Ben, at what moment in your life did you realize you were powerful? Did you realize that this was not going to keep you down? Whew, so many moments. Um, but it was when I was able to actually um, not allow fear to be undefeated. Like when I actually looked fear in the eyes and said, not today, dude. Like I'm actually going to look you in the eye and say, we're going to become familiar with each other. Mm -hmm. Because when you're not familiar with fear, that's when it rains. Yeah. Because then it's elusive. But when you become familiar with fear as if it comes in the door like a guest... And you and, and you 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 say two, one or two things. What's up, man? Take a seat right over here because we're gonna chat. And then, and then you communicate with it, or you look in its eye, spit in both eyes, and say, "You're not freaking wel welcome here. You may be welcome next door, not here." When I started having a little bit of understanding that I could have some control outside of Cruzon syndrome. So many people just worry so much about, oh, I can't control that, and they live in that moment. I can't, I can't control Cruzon syndrome. Like plastic surgery after plastic surgery after plastic surgery, still look a little bit different. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. <laughs> what a gift. How do you, how does this still affect you today? this cruise on syndrome, if at all, physically. In what way? For good or bad? What For do you... bad, yeah. Do you deal with any ailments, ongoing ailments at all from this? Uh, so let's define what cruise on syndrome is because yeah. then that will help me explain what I'm about to yeah. explain. Cruise on syndrome affects the mid part of the face. So at different levels in my life of maturity, be able to go in, cut my head open from ear to ear, put a trach, take bones from different parts of my body and restructure it, wire my mouth shut. So after all the surgeries, I can bite down, I can chew, I can swallow normal. Breathing at one point wasn't very good. Um, what major you at this point? Like after all these are done? Uh, I, my last major, major surgery was a, around the age of 20. Okay. And I'm I'm 40, almost 41. Yeah. So I haven't had a major surgery besides some reconstruction, no surgeries because of wrestling, right? For for a while, but um, what one thing that I may have today is maybe some hearing stuff, because it. But um, besides that, man, everything positive. People still look, of course. People can say stuff. But you don't feel anything different. Like, you don't feel ongoing ailments because of this. No. Personally. Yeah. No. I want to talk about when did you make the decision to be a wrestler? How old were you? Oh, man. First of all, doctors would tell me that... <laughs> Contact sports are probably no out way. of the realm of possibilities. <laughs> totally. totally. <laughs> I mean, imagine going and begging your parents as you cut your head open from ear to ear and your face swells up like this. You're and like, you're I like, want to go bang this into other dudes. Dad, can I go bang this? 
$75,000, you know, yeah. <laughs> fix Don't. up right here to somebody else's forehead. And they're like, ah. um, it would be my brother. And my whole family wrestled. I had an uncle that was a national champion in junior college. My dad wrestled a year at BYU, played football at BYU for a year before he got into law school and stuff. And so, like, it was in my blood. And uh, my brother would go to something called Little Viking Wrestling at Viewmont High School that was for elementary kids. It's basically, like, structured babysitting (laughs) for kids in a wrestling room. (laughs) And I would go to watch my older brother, just two years older than me. His name's Luke. And it was competition day where they would give away medals at the end of the, like, six-week season. And I show up, and it was maybe, like, a year or two after surgery, pretty, like, and I'm not wrestling. But as I showed up and my brother was competing, I saw him get a medal at the end, like, probably the size of a quarter, if that. And then I saw other kids get medals at the end. And then I saw kids my age get medals at the end. And I convinced myself at that moment I wasn't leaving that day without a freaking medal. (laughs) So I was grabbing kids on the (laughs) sidelines. And I'm like, yo, you want to wrestle? He's like, no. I'm like, fine. I'm going to wrestle you anyway. (laughs) And I would grab him and wrestle him. So the director of the whole, uh, like, Little Vikings, it's Bart Thompson. And I'm doing a documentary, and this is in the documentary, this piece. And Bart says, Ben, what I did is I saw you volunteer more than anybody else who actually paid, and you out-wrestled everyone. And your mom came up to me with you crying behind her. And she said, well, what do I have to do for this kid? I need to buy a medal. Can I buy a medal? He ain't leaving without a medal today. His older brother got one. Bart Thompson, who who became a mentor and later became my high school coach, grabbed me. I'm probably two foot two. (laughs) Grabbed me. Put me on the podium and says, congratulations, champ. You out-wrestled everyone. And grabbed a medal, put it on my neck. And from that day forward, I started believing that I could do whatever And I'll never forget standing on top of that podium and feeling like I was a true champion. And that changed my life. It's powerful. I mean, it only takes one person, right, to to help you believe further than you already believed, right? And that was him. You go on to become (laughs) one of the greatest wrestlers in history. Right. So how does that happen? I mean, how do you how do you go from being a two foot two kid begging for a medal to representing Team USA as one of the greatest, you know, wrestlers of all time? You know what's unique is that uh there's a lot of incredible wrestlers around that are world champions that have been to levels that I even haven't been to. But I don't know of one that's overcome something like Cruzon syndrome to do that. Yeah. That's where the story is. Every single person, whether it's physical and whether you can see it or not, has those obstacles. Yeah. What is the thing in your life that I call a proving ground? And then what do you do about it? What I decided, it's easy. It's easy to go through and heal from a surgery compared to the mental side of it. Mm. We all go do these physical reps. We go to the gym. You and I can go to the gym. Let's pump out 20 reps of push-ups. Yeah. But how often do we go to the mental gym? How often do we do the go to the mind gym? Because my doctors would say, oh, yeah, mom and dad care. Guess what? Yeah, this physical thing, save your money, but also save your money for all the, the mental stuff, the counselors, the therapists, the psychologists. Your boy's going to need that. Along the path, I knew that the physical reps and the mental reps could actually be helpful when you run them together. What do I mean? What I mean is this. I talked earlier before about being disobedient to average. Mm. 
I learned along the way, after my mom countless times told me after being made fun of in public, after she would cuddle with me, she'd say, Ben, you're born different. You look a little bit different. So guess what? We're going to make a difference. And then she'd say, you're going to get some attention, maybe unwanted sometimes. So take that attention, and when you have it, whether you like it or not, shine in that attention. Shine. So I would go to practice, and this would be the difference for me, that would allow me to gain the national, like the All-American status, the state championship status, the national championship status, and then later the world championship status, right? Or the world champion status. Here's what would happen, is I would go to practice and I would make a decision. I have now chosen that I don't want to be normal. Tyler, for the long, the longest time in my life, I prayed to be normal. I would pray to God that if I could just wake up tomorrow morning, that he could just fix my face. If I could just eat something different, if, I, if something could happen, I believed in miracles, but you know what the miracle was? He kept giving me Cruzon syndrome. That was the biggest blessing. And I prayed to be normal. I prayed not to stick out. I prayed to fit in. It just so happens that my documentary I have coming out next year is called Stand Out. Because I chose finally that what what is life lived if you're just going to fit in? What's life lived if you're just going to just take take participation. So when I would go to practice, my coach, Bart Thompson, would yell around the room, 20 push-ups. He would yell a cadence for everyone in the room. 20 push-ups, 20 push-ups, let's go. Boom, 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 we'd drop down. But in the sport of wrestling, it's a little bit different. There's one guy that claims a gold medal, one. And I learned that. In Little Viking Wrestling, there's one guy at the top of the podium. So if there's 50 guys in the room and he yells a cadence to do 20 push-ups, you better believe you learn to be disobedient to average the right way. 20 push-ups became a minimum. 25, 30, 40. Eventually it came a game to where I didn't stop until everyone quit and then I did 10 more. That was a difference. That's when the physical repetitions became a mental edge. Mm. And powerful. those are the moments that you learn how to win before <laughs> you ever win. It got to the point, you're going to love this. <laughs> it got to the point in high school, there had never been a three-time state champion ever in my high school. And I got a gift from my parents. You remember the Letterman's jackets? Yeah. I got a Letterman's jackets. Letterman jacket, my junior year, I'd won state once. My goal was to be a three-time state champion. And I said, what do you want on your jacket? All these, you know, all these um, little, uh, what do they call them? Little patches. Yeah, they yeah. give you all these little patches on your jacket. And one of the last patches I put on my right shoulder was 3X. And I'd won state one time. <laughs> and it was to be a three-time state champion. I believed that if I could see it, with a daily reminder, then I could believe it as long as I knew how to achieve it with being disobedient to average and outworking everybody. Yeah. And that was what I could control. There's a lot in life I couldn't control, but I could control my input. Yeah. I can control what I did every single day. And then secondly, so my action. Secondly, that input was a verbal input. So every day I would look in the mirror and instead of saying, oh, this and this and you know, this can't change and this can't change if I had this different or that different or that different, I changed the script and I started changing the narrative. And I started pouring into myself and I started becoming my, my number one fan. I tell you, one of my God gifts is to pour into other people. That never comes when you don't do you first, yeah. ever. And so when I started to be a fanboy of Ben Care first, I could be a fanboy of anybody else second. And I chose in my, uh, I'd love to give this to you, is to give a gift to your listeners. It's, uh, it's what I call my victory chant. And in my victory chant, I, 
every single thing. It's a positive self-talk. It's an incantation, whatever you want to call it. I literally go through every single step. My first one is now I choose me. Now I choose me because I didn't choose me. I chose to be Bobby, Billy, and Tommy version 2.0, bro. I'd walk down the hallway and just wish that I could dress like them, act like them, live like them. As parents, we freaking do that. We do that today as adults, and we should know better. But we want to be the person on the hill. We want to be the person with this vehicle. We want to be the person with this money or these kids. We're mocking. We're literally mocking God by doing that. He created us, bro. Us. Ben Care. And I want to be Tommy Thomas? Yeah. You freaking kidding me? Not until I learned how to flex Ben Care did my world change, dude. And when my world changed, other people's worlds could be changed by Ben Care. But it took me to learn me, to pour into me, to input me. Action, input me verbally. And then, and then my output totally changed. Thank you to our sponsors over at Bucked Up. I love this company. I love their products, their apparel, and their supplements. Recently, they dropped the mother of all pre-workouts, Mother Bucker. This is not for the faint of heart. This will make you want to claw your face off. So don't get stuck in traffic when you're headed to the gym. I love these guys. I love this company, and I love their products. They are clearly the best tasting pre-workout on the entire market and they're number one for a reason. Bucked Up is my favorite workout brand, hands down. And they also have my favorite apparel for working out and just for daily life. It's Lululemon-like quality, but for a fraction of the price that's affordable. So head over to their site, buckedup.com, where you can check it out. And for 20% off their entire site, use the code TylerHall20. Yeah. Your father? Father of three. Ages? Five, five, and four. Okay. My understanding is that it wasn't easy for mm -hmm. you and for your wife to become parents, right? Your countenance changed when I asked you if you were a father. I knew you were a father, right? You're different now. You've got a different yeah. look on your face, right? This obviously means the world to you, and when you have to when you have to go through what you went through to have a child, I think you probably have a different level of appreciation for your kids. Um, talk to me about what you guys went through as you tried to get pregnant. I've got some data here that helps me understand, you know, maybe a version of that. But what did you and your wife go through? I come from seven kids in my family. My wife, my wife comes from nine. Family's super important, right? A lot of siblings. We had dreams of having a big family. Ten years after getting married and suffering four IVF cycles, two miscarriages, a little boy and a baby girl. One would be when I was on the road speaking. And my wife calls me and just in tears. She says, Ben, this little boy that was breathing last week at the hospital, he's not breathing anymore. I, like, I need you to come home. So I'm, I'm on the next flight home just to hold my wife. And then we step into adoption and nine months into adoption, eight, going into the nine month, literally after we pay our last payment to a birth mom. And we mat got matched day one. She emails us and says, you know, 45 grand in, I'm keeping the baby, and that broke our hearts. Money comes and goes. There's the pain that, like, you can't, uh, you can't get a <laughs> refund on that. So we got matched with another mom. Six months later, she stopped showing up to doctor's appointments, and she found out, we found out through investigative work that, that she was placing the same baby girl with two other families. And I'll never forget telling my wife that and her just like pounding on my chest, just like bawling. As I just held her, she just said, Ben, like, why does this have to happen to us? And uh, me and my wife decided 
that we were going to choose new beginnings and not dead ends. And so we would celebrate the new beginning instead of thinking that it was a dead end, which it easily could have been. In a lot of aspects it is, right? But it's terminated. Like there's no baby there. With that being said, with new beginnings, you, you, you arrive differently with hope. And I think this is a lesson, though, that's happened numerous times in my life. When you feel like you're at that dead end, it's interesting how God works. In those moments is when he works the most powerful. A couple minutes ago, we talked about the next decision you make after the darkest of times is your legacy decision. I remember being so angry, so angry. And uh, that night was really hard for me because it was something I couldn't control again. I would beat Kruzan Syndrome, I felt. Kruzan Syndrome was my friend. It was actually an asset. But with my wife involved, it was hard. I can't control it now. And the next morning, we had a call that there was a boy that was born and they asked if we wanted to be parents. <laughs> I said, heck yeah, let's do it. We're like, do we ever? Yeah, 15 hours later, we're, we're parents. And they told me on that call that the night before when we were in the darkest of despairs, that's when my boy Liam was born. And in life, I think in our darkest of times, the birth of something else is about is happening. And I think that birth is a gift. Mm. And so if we can just remember, no matter no matter who's listening to this, there's someone out there that's going through a dark time, going through a miscarriage, going through a divorce, going through a relapse, whatever it is. In those times, that's a rebirth of your, your new opportunity. Yeah. And it's not always a dead end. How do you figure that out? Well, you figure it out by taking a step forward in that new opportunity, yeah. in that new beginning. But you'll never figure it out if you don't, if you don't step that way. Mm -hmm. And um, while we were out there to get Liam, next thing you know, we were offered another baby girl. The adoption director said, hey, you guys had a miscarriage of a boy and a girl, right? It was like, well, yeah. She's like, what if I told you there's another birth mom and your kids would be five days apart? So when I say the ages of my kids, five, five, and four, it doesn't mean they're twins. They're mm -hmm. literally from different moms. Yeah. And then the last one that's four just happens to be my oldest boy, his full blood brother. Mm. And so I tell you what, if talking about how things are supposed to happen, if that first adoption would have worked, I would have never had three of my kids. It was so supposed to work. The biggest <laughs> gift, the biggest blessing. Sometimes in those dark moments, we just get a look a step ahead, knowing that it's supposed to happen. There's a new beginning. We'll be grateful for it. And I am. How do you think about the line between um, God orchestrating these things and predetermining what happens in our life, right? So I know you're a faith, a faithful man. I know you believe in God. We've talked about him multiple times. What part did he play in orchestrating all of that to get to where you're at today with these three beautiful children? Yeah, so that's a great question. I love that. I don't know if I've ever had anybody ask me that. I think we all have a potential and we all have a strength and the ability to grow. And I think there's millions of ways to get there. And I don't know if there's a predetermined thing, but I do know this. I believe there's happiness to be found, and I believe there's thousands of ways to get there too. Mm. I don't think it has to be through kids. I don't think it has to be through family. I don't think it has to be through marriage. I think there's ways of happiness through all of those. But I think it's an internal fulfillment. I do believe that I think through trials, we feel like we lose happiness. And I believe that God gifts us trials to 
give us happiness. Mm. And as we go through trials with what I call tenacious patience, then things like end up good. Things end up great. We just get to keep our nose down with that tenacious patience, love, and a little ounce of hope, and things are good. God's part of it the whole way, absolutely. And is there orchestra? Is there a sym symphony behind there? Yeah, I believe so. I believe there's direction the whole way. I believe that I could have been just as happy with my own blood kids. Yeah. Who else better to raise a kid with Cruzon syndrome than me? I've yeah. done it. I've mm -hmm. done it. But also, how did my wife and I grow together during those times? Oh, my gosh. And how did I un think I, I thought I could never love a human that wasn't my blood like I could a child with my blood. I tell you what, right now, Tyler, if I were to have a child, my wife would get pregnant and we'd have a child with our blood, there would be no more ounce of love than I have with these three, three kids. So what's that go to say? As a human, we could pour into anybody, blood related or not, blood related or not, as we serve them. As we serve, love comes. As we focus, love comes. And I think that's a lesson that I've learned. What are your non-negotiables for your kids? What values do you hope that they'll remember about the way that you treated them as a father or the way that you acted as a father? Um, my non-negotiables for my kids may be a little bit different than maybe what you're expecting, but my non-negotiable for my kids are m more me because I believe as a parent, our children set their standards really by default based upon our standards. I say that in all responsibility of parents. You want your kids to live big? Freaking live big. Mm. You want to yap your mouth? Maybe you should shut your mouth and start living big. I'll never forget literally being in Florida, sitting, sitting in a seat. Ed Milet gets up. I had three kids at this time. They just got done with wrestling season. Ed Milet comes to the stage and said, one of the most insidious forms of child neglect is a parent not living their dreams. You know what non-negotiable non -negotiable is for my kids? I'll tell you. Me not living my dreams. That's non-negotiable. Yeah. I got out of my seat. I'm like, I better... S During the last wrestling season, I was yapping in the corner. Do this. Do that. Into my four-year-old kid's ears. I'm a 40-year-old guy. Come on. <laughs> Instead, I shut my mouth and went to work. Six months later, after not competing for 10 years, I found myself at the United States National Wrestling Tournament in Las Vegas. I sucked a bunch of, diff a bunch of weight that I hadn't in 10 years, <laughs> and my kids sat there and watched me in the corner as they coached me as the roles were reversed and they were yapping at me. Mm. And uh, little did my opponents know that was my secret weapon. <laughs> and my kids were yelling in the corner, smash him, daddy, smash him. Champion of the world. And they were, I, I, I would, I have incredible coaches, incredible training at Utah Valley University. I went into, Outscore my opponent 64 to 2 and got the medals and got the things. And this is the difference. When you're a national champion, they give you something that we call in the wrestling world stop sign because it's a big wooden plaque that's heavy with a huge medal. My youngest boy, Kempton, who's three years old at this time, I have it on video. I show it when I'm speaking. He grabs the big medal as we're going to the stand to take photos. And he says, Mommy, 
we're winning, we're winning, mommy. <laughs> and my wife said, who's winning? I'm winning. I mean, dad is winning. As we choose as parents to win by action and have that be a non-negotiable for our kids, that we're the default, yeah. that we're their standard, because that's all they know, then they are winning. They grab the medal and they're winning. And even when I've lost at the world championships, I've lost. I thought, and a lot of us don't put ourselves out there because of fear of failure, fear of not being enough, fear of what would happen. Yeah. As I lost, I was winning, I just stopped wrestling. My kid was crying in the stands. I went back to the apartment, we we're in Greece, not knowing what my kids would say. As soon as I walked in the door, I came in with the silver medal and they grabbed it and they put it over them, their head as if it was the biggest gold medal in the world. Mm. And they ran around the room <laughs> saying, we did it, we did it. <laughs> you know what we did? We put ourselves out there, that's what we did. You know what we did? We stood out, and that was a non-negotiable. You know what we did for the months before that, not just that day of what I thought was a failure? We showed up in the morning. You know what we did? We chose the broccoli over the chocolate. You know what we did? They did the same because they thought that was normal. That's my non-negotiable. It's beautiful. There's a This idea came from St. Francis Assisi's um, thousands of years ago, right, where he, he talked about um, teach love, teach patience, teach humility and kindness, and when necessary, use words, mm. right? I think it's all about, I, I like to call it, you know, like Marshawn Lynch would say, to be about that action, boss, mm. right? Like talk is, talk is cheap. I want to ask you this: Who was the who was the toughest opponent you ever had to wrestle in your life? I tell you what, um, it wouldn't be who you think it would be. Um, so, number one, I would say myself. Number one, that's myself because that would happen way before I'd ever put on a singlet. Yeah. Period. <clears throat> Just to get to the match, I had to beat myself, my doubts, yeah. my fears. And if people watching this don't think we don't have a dark side, whew, we're all wrong. Luke Skywalker's father used to be a good dude. That's Darth Vader. <laughs> the darkest of them. Yeah. We all have a dark side. Do we allow that to, 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 to be victorious? And I choose no. Number two, did I wrestle the world champions, Olympic champions, close overtime matches? There's a kid named Michael Martinez from Wyoming that never was an All-American. The reason why I hated wrestling him was because he never gave up. And win, lose, or draw, and this is what I teach to my athletes that I coach, I say this, win, lose, or draw, never, ever have them ever want to wrestle you again. Never, I say this, never have that person want to wrestle you again. Have that person, by the end of the match, whether their hands raise or yours, have them think that they never want to wrestle you ever again because you never stop swinging, theoretically, they right? just keep coming, yeah. He would keep coming. And this is an example of him. His career's done. He ends up moving back home, and there's a fire on in his house. And this is the type of person Michael Martinez is. There's a dog back in the house. When the fire is almost gone or just taken away his house, he runs back in to go get his animal. He comes out and he's basically burned his whole body. It's that type of person that would always go in the fire. 
I want to be around the people. When people ask me who you're surrounding yourself with, I'm like, I tell them when the house is on fire, I want to be around the people that go in, mm. not go out. I want to be around the firemen that went up the buildings in, in 2001 and 9-11. I want to be those individuals. I want to be around those individuals that are constantly going in when everything says go out, go away. Yeah. Because those are the difference makers. Those are the change makers. That's beautifully said. I want to end with a fun one, okay? There's this guy on the internet named Bradley Martin. Are you familiar? Mm -mm. You seen this guy? Big 260-pound bodybuilder, and, you know, he's he's got a big podcast called Raw Talk, and he has on UFC fighters and wrestling world champions and all these things. And, yeah. you know, he's, he's become famously known for saying, like, I think I could take at 260 jacked, I think I could take, like, Floyd Mayweather, or I think I could take, name the UFC sure. fighter that's 200 pounds, right? He's like, I'm just so much bigger. If I can just get a hold of him, then I would, like, kill him, right? And you have these UFC fighters that love to challenge that. So I, I want to ask you this question, Ben. So if you think of a – you're still, like, obviously very capable wrestler. Like, sure. at this stage of your life, you're still very capable. Normal, same-age guy, 40-year-old. Yeah. What – pound like how big would they have to be normal dude never wrestled yeah <laughs> for you not to beat them like two, <laughs> 200 250 so this just happened can i tell you yeah can i tell you what happened and how how it went yeah. <laughs> so and, and, and why it went the way that it did <laughs> yeah i have a i have a really funny brother-in-law <laughs> that actually married my wife's twin so we're pretty close okay. And uh, he's a dentist, and he has this dental retreat, yeah. and he says, hey, come with us. And so we go to Moab. He always matches me up with dudes. <laughs> it just so happens that uh, this guy wrestled back in the day, and he's 250 pounds. Just 250. so happens he's 250. How much do you weigh, by the way, just for? Uh, I'm like 135, 140. Okay, so not even 150. No. So he's 100 pounds. He's 100 plus, plus pounds okay. bigger than me. <laughs> Now, I'm going to tell the secret of how to take out big dudes, okay. even if they've competed or not. You go for their head, and this is why. A big guy, his head will always stay attached. Yeah. And so as you move their head, their body follows. Physically, the head will follow the body. Mentally, you break them by taking the head out. And so what I would do is I would attack the head over and over and over again. And then eventually when I would fake for the head, he would pull it up and then you, then you attack the legs after that. But uh, that's how you take him out. And he ended up quitting. You got him. He tapped out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the answer is there's no amount of weight for somebody who's never wrestled that you're not going to – you're not going to be able to get those legs and get them in a choke kind of thing. Well, what I'm saying is that uh, technique, technique means everything. Yeah. Technique and mental approach. Yeah. You got to know how to play the game. Yeah. And even, even if you're the same size, a lot younger, I mean, I wrestle with the college half my age every day. Yeah. And uh, there's still mental approach. There's, there's knowing how to – with wisdom, you know how to live life. You know how to fight different. You know mm -hmm. how to fight smarter. It's more of a strategic play. Absolutely. I want to. So I want to talk about next year. You've got a couple of big things happening. You have your book that's going to be released, and then you have your documentary that's going to be released. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd love to. I'd love to wrap the show. Okay. I'm assuming a lot of what's in your book. And what's in your documentary are things that inspire people to fight, inspire people to make the right decision in those dark moments, right? To turn that darkness into light. It's 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 a lot of the conversation that we're having, okay? There's a lot of people out there struggling. Hmm. I get messages all the time from people every day hmm. saying, man, I heard, I saw the story with Kelly Bills who lost his wife, man, and I'm really str I'm struggling with something right now. I lost a spouse and that inspired me, that helped me get through it, right? There's a lot of people struggling, whether it's, there's levels to this game of struggle, right? But everybody's struggling at their own level that's very painful and it hurts. Mm. So so I want you to, in this camera, your camera, I want you to face 
the audience, and I want you to share some words of just encouragement and hope to people that feel like they're in a in a place that's unrecoverable in mm. their life. And then I want you to talk about at the end the book and the documentary that's coming out. Cool. Which one's mine? Right here. This one right here. Yep. Hey guys, what's going on? Number one, I just want to tell you, I see you and I feel you. I've been in those moments. I'll never forget when I came home from a public location where an adult, when I was a young kid, told me that I shouldn't even go out in public and he was surprised I had friends. I want to tell you that day I went home and tried to physically figure out a way to take my face off. I want to tell you that in that moment, I had people that surrounded me when I felt like I couldn't recover and tell me that it was okay and that I could move forward and that I was gifted those things for a reason. I would go on to learn that they were right. Number one, you have the opportunity to keep moving forward. Number two, Keep moving forward with the people that can buoy you up. If you don't have those people in your life, I would encourage you to upgrade. I would encourage you to upgrade and then secondly, ask yourself if you're that person. In your darkest of times, when you're thinking right now, you can't go on for yourself anymore. Maybe it's not about you. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's not just for you, but it's for somebody else. Maybe there's a bigger picture. Maybe there's a way out of that little bit of selfish behavior, behavior. And maybe, just maybe, as you overcome and blast out of this moment right now, you're going to live the tell how you did it for somebody else. I've learned that as I have overcome and been able to stand up and stand out in those moments, I've been able to teach somebody else how to do it. What if you were that hero for somebody else and you're actually living that moment to tell right now? What if I told you that you're literally writing your story for so many other people to hear, see, and follow? Guys, I want to tell you that God is so good and you're needed, not just for you. I know that in those darkest of moments, I've been able to walk forward understanding that the picture was way bigger than just me. In my documentary and in my book coming out in 2025, I'm going to tell you how that happens. All the funny and quirky ways of how it happens and how it did happen and how we got to that point and how there's still trials and struggles along the way and how we approach it differently. God bless you guys. Beautiful. That's a wrap. Thanks, Ben.